hopefully you can see the screen okay just let me know if you can't can you see that okay yeah brilliant all right so let's talk about this and let's link in some things so the autonomic nervous system um what does it do well it's responsible for maintenance it's going to maintain basal level of activity to the internal organs it responds to the change to monitor the level of activity in the internal organs and it in coordinates things like functions for example things like the digestive system for digestion and as you know it is divided up into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system now this is what often causes people confusion and so uh, when it comes to the physiology between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system we have to kind of look for a moment at the anatomy and think about it. So if you think about the sympathetic system, um, you've probably spent time in the cadaver lab, right? And you've looked in the cadaver and you look at the brain and you look at the spinal cord and you see that running alongside the spinal cord, you have the sympathetic chain. You have that sympathetic chain ganglion which comes down. So that is in structurally, that is related to the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, if you think about your vagus nerve and how the vagus nerve comes down, so I can just give you a couple of examples. So here we have the um, sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you just think about the anatomy for a minute, like I said, the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic trunk running down, and the parasympathetic nervous system is running parallel to the sympathetic. So the sympathetic is central and the parasympathetic is running alongside it. So, for example, with the parasympathetic nervous system, you've got the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is going to come down and it's going to be responsible for innovating the heart, the lungs, the liver, the spleen, the stomach, small intestine, proximal colon, the kidney. And from down below, from S1, S2 and S3, it's going to come up and it's going to supply the distal colon, the rectum, the urinary bladder and the genitalia. So, you know, the, the, the first thing I try and uh, explain um, is think of it like this. The sympathetic system is a bit like a ladder. It really is. It's like a ladder. It looks like a ladder. It looks like something out of Donkey Kong. You know, Donkey Kong's going to run up and down this ladder. And it's central, okay? It's sympathetic. And the parasympathetic is almost like um, it's like a Virginia creeper. It comes down, it's like a rope, and it runs parallel to the sympathetic nervous system. It runs alongside it. So that's the sympathetic and that's the parasympathetic. So there's a couple of things physiologically that we need to know about the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So physiologically, the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or flight response. It's a stress responder and it's the systemic fire alarm. It's what tells the system, hey, we need to make things happen. We need to do something. The parasympathetic physiologically does the opposite. It's responsible for rest and digest. It is responsible for resting homeostasis and it calms the system down so it's the opposite so the two things work in harmony together they are like the scales of justice you have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system working alongside each other you can't have one without the other you've got to have both of them and they've both got to be working in to some degree you know you can't have too much sympathetic tone because then you're going to reduce parasympathetic and you can't have too much parasympathetic because then you're going to reduce sympathetic. So you've got to have the two working together. And so structurally, as I say, they are divided up by the sympathetic chain and parasympathetic by the vagus nerve and the pelvic S1, S2 and S3, which is going to come up. So you've got the parasympathetic and the sympathetic working together. Now, how do they work on a physiological level in relation to tissues? So this is where it gets um, this is where it gets interesting. And this is where we 
link in several subjects all at once. So here we talk about pharmacology and we talk about physiology. So first of all, we want to define what the somatic system is. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. Okay, somatic, somatic system. What is the somatic system and what is it made up of? Um, isn't the somatic system um, like the, the thing that like the, the cortical spinal, like the tracts in the brain that go down and innervate them, the, like the muscles? So what tissue types are we talking about when we talk about the somatic system? What, what tissue types are we talking about? So we've got different, think about histology. And we, and if I said to you, okay, so we're going to do a histology class. And today the topic is going to be on somatic innovation. What kind of tissue types are we going to be looking at? Um, like when, somatic, like the, the muscles of the, like the, around the lungs, like in the, in the, uh, like the intercostal muscles, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, what kind of tissue is that? That is skeletal muscle. Yeah. Skeletal muscle. Okay. Okay. Now, you just said about the lungs, right? The lungs. Um. What kind of tissue are the lungs? And how do they differ from somatic? In like fact, the, the the muscles around the lungs, I guess. Not 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 the not the actual muscles around the lungs. The actual the actual tissue of the lungs. How? All right, let me give you an example. Right. So here's a muscle. But let's say that this is a muscle. This is an intercostal muscle. And forgive my drawing. This is meant to be a lung. Right. That's meant to be a lung. Horrible looking lung. Anyway. Right. So I say. Right. Let's take a cross section of this muscle tissue. And let's take a cross section of this lung tissue. Um, now, obviously, these are two very, very different tissue types. OK, this one is skeletal muscle. Mm. This is visceral tissue. OK, mm. now I'm going to ask you a physiological question. Physiologically, what is the difference between these when it comes to the nervous system and control of the nervous system? Now, that's, that sounds like a difficult question, but just think about it for a minute. Physiologically, what is the difference between these two tissues and the nervous system? Let me ask you it a different way. Can you control vasodilation and vasoconstriction? No, you can't. Why? Because when you're like, I guess you can't control breathing. You can't control the heart. It beats yeah. itself. Right, right. You can't. So, so cardiac tissue is yeah. different from skeletal tissue because you can't yeah. control it. Yeah. You can't exactly. control it. You can't control cardiac tissue. You can't control... Um, you can't control your blood vessels. You can't consciously, I can't consciously say, right, I want my veins to vasodilate and now I want them to vasoconstrict. But what I can do is I can control my muscles in my hands. I can control the muscles in my face. And that's because they're somatic. They're all somatic, right? And so what somatic means is that somatic falls under two different principles there's something called general somatic afference and something called general somatic efference now do you know what the difference between the two are the afferents are what i like the thing like the nerves that would be going to for instance the skeletal muscle mm -hmm. uh and the afferent uh, uh yeah, and the afferent would be the one going back to the to the brain. Okay, so the afferent is the ascending pathway, yeah. and the efferent is the descending pathway. So e means engine, e for engine, and an engine makes things do something. So that's motor. E is motor. A is afferent, which is sensory. Mm -hmm. 
And this is somatic. So this is all somatic. This is what we can control. So there's, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, somatic is different from the other tissue types. Somatic is different from the other tissue types because we can control it. We have general somatic afferents and efferents. These are the physiological principles which govern our control of our musculoskeletal system. So unlike, for example, let's think about the heart, right? The heart is under autonomic control. The heart comes under two totally different principles. The heart comes under general visceral efferents and afferents. It's not something we can control. We don't have, uh, you know, um, the heart is not skeletal muscle. It's cardiac muscle. It's a totally different tissue and it works in a totally different way. So that's the very, very, very first thing. Now, the second thing is, OK, so fine. We know that we can control skeletal muscle and we know that this falls under the somatic nervous system. Now, how does the how does this physiologically and biochemically work? Well, what we have is we have a couple of things. On skeletal muscle, we have these receptors. What are these receptors called? Um, the recept uh... What receptors do we have on skeletal muscle? I don't, I don't remember, actually. Um, they're nicotonic receptors. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. These are nicotonic receptors. So skeletal muscle, remember this, skeletal muscle is very, very, very specific. It has right. nicotonic receptors. And what biochemical interacts with nicotonic receptors? Uh, acetylcholine. Perfect. Exactly. So acetylcholine. So what would norepinephrine do to it? Uh, I don't think norepinephrine binds to the... Mm, right. It's a totally yeah. different It's a totally different binding, isn't it? Because oh. norepinephrine is going to bind to smooth muscle. Okay? So norepinephrine is not going to bind to nicotonic receptors. So nicotonic receptors... So thing to remember, nicotonic receptors are specific to skeletal muscle and specifically what binds to nicotonic receptors is acetylcholine. Mm. Now, another thing, there's another thing that we want to add to this. Um, so there's a couple of things. So first of all, somatic. Somatic is different. Somatic comes under general somatic afferents and efferents. Efferents is the motor response. Afferents is the ascending pathway. Efferents is the descending pathway. Somatic is to do with skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is to do with acetylcholine and nicotonic receptors. That is the link. Nicotonic receptors and choline. Now look at the motor neuron from the somatic system. You have a really, really long motor neuron. And at the end of the motor neuron, you have the acetylcholine, which is released into the nicotonic receptors. Now we're going to look at the autonomic nervous system. We're going to look at the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. And you're going to see that there's a big difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. So let me just go back a couple of slides. So first of all, what is the physiological um, what is the physiological properties of the sympathetic system? Fight or flight, stress responder, systemic fire alarm. What is it structurally? It's a ladder. Just think of it as a ladder. Makes things simple. So the sympathetic system is going to be divided up into two areas. It has two different areas. Now, this is where this causes people confusion, but it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to be that difficult. And I'll explain why. So sympathetic, this is our ladder. I, I like drawing stupid pictures. You'll see, I, I think it, or at least for me, it makes it easier. Some people say it makes it easier. Okay, so this is a sympathetic system. This is central. Now, this is what 
confuses people because they say, wait a minute, acetylcholine and nicotonic receptors, but wait, isn't that the same as the skeletal muscle? Yes, it is, but it's not, right? Because the nicotonic receptors are not on skeletal muscle. So what happens with the sympathetic nervous system is we have something called a preganglionic region and a postganglionic region. So this is before it's gone, it's ganglionated, and this is after it's ganglionated. So the, the sympathetic system is going to interlace with two tissue types. It's going to be responsible for smooth muscle and glands and sweat glands. I say tissue types, I'm just grouping it. I'm just grouping it up. Okay, so the sympathetic system is going to innovate smooth muscle glands and sweat glands. And it's going to do that via two different routes. It's got two pathways that it can go to. One is via norepinephrine. And the other is via acetylcholine. But this is different because the acetylcholine, unlike the somatic system, the acetylcholine on the sweat glands, do you know what the M stands for? What kind of receptor it is on the muscle? Muscarine? Yes, muscarinic, exactly. Yeah, these are the muscarinic receptors. So on the sweat glands, we've got these muscarinic receptors. And on the smooth muscle, we have these other receptors, which are called alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. So these are different types of receptors. These are the end receptors, but we don't just get straight to the end receptors. Now, this is where it gets interesting because this is where we look at how drugs, this is how we target drugs, and this is how specific drugs work. So, for example, we have the sympathetic system. Sympathetic system, preganglionic, before it's ganglionated, the first checkpoint we come to is acetylcholine to the nicotonic receptor. The acetylcholine to the nicotonic receptor then can go one of two ways, depending on what kind of tissue. So if we want to innovate the smooth muscle, we're going to go postganglionic and we're going to release norepinephrine into the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2s. If we want to innovate the sweat glands, we are going to go postganglionic acetylcholine onto the muscarinic receptors. And remember, this is all going to fight or flight, stress responder, systemic. This is all sympathetic, not parasympathetic. Now, what is the problem with this? Well, some drugs, for example, nicotine, nicotine, nicotine is a drug. Nicotine is non-selective. So we don't tend to develop drugs which are going to specifically work on this area. And why is that? Well, because it's not really very targeted. Say, for example, me and you wanted to develop a drug and we were sitting down in a conference room and we were like, right, OK, so you said, well, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to develop a drug which has a sympathetic effect on the alpha one and alpha two um, receptors on smooth muscle. And I said, okay, well, I've got an idea. Why don't we develop a drug which affects the acetylcholine and the nicotonic receptors uh, on the preganglionic end plate? Yeah, but you're going to say, but Will, that's not really a very good idea because that's a very unspecific drug because that drug is not only going to completely knock out the smooth muscle glands and the sweat muscle glands, it's it's you know okay yeah it's going to help some of the symptoms that we're trying to manage but it's it's really not going to be very targeted so we sit down again and we think okay so what about if we develop a drug which interacts on the norepinephrine binding of alpha one and alpha two at the end of the postganglionic um route ah Yes, that makes sense. Now that drug would be useful because that's going to be targeted. And so what, what you will come to see is this, this first diagram is incredibly useful. It is incredibly useful because every drug 
that you'll talk about and every drug that you'll learn about has some effect on different tissues in different parts, whether it be to do with the somatic nervous system, whether it be do with the sympathetic nervous system, whether it be do with the parasympathetic nervous system, whether it be to do with the adrenal medulla, which I'm just going to come on to. So these drugs here, these are experimental. These drugs, this circular area, which I've put an arrow on, these are experimental. And these are experimental groups because they're non-specific. These are non-specific. I'll just write N-O-N, non. These are non-specific. These are non-specific. These groups are specific. So, you know, we're going to look at different groups of drugs which affect, you know, they block norepinephrine. They block norepinephrine reuptake or they increase norepinephrine. They block acetylcholine or they increase acetylcholine. Um, you know, these are all sympathetic drugs. Parasympathetic system, slightly different. Now, this is going to make sense now. The parasympathetic nervous system, look at the preganglionic part. The preganglionic part is much longer. Now, if we go back to that little silly picture I did, I said that the sympathetic system is like a ladder. And the parasympathetic systems like, you know, like a rope, which is hanging down. And the vagus nerve is a great example of that rope because the vagus nerve, it literally comes down and it covers the heart, lungs, liver, spleen, stomach, small intestine, proximal colon, kidney, et cetera, et cetera. It comes down. And so the parasympathetic, unlike the sympathetic, the parasympathetic has a much longer preganglionic channel. So the preganglionic channel is much, 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 much longer than the sympathetic. So it's short, sympathetic, short, parasympathetic, long, sympathetic, ladder, short, parasympathetic, rope, long. The similarity between the two, again, is you have two stages. You have the first stage, which is the acetylcholine with the nicotonic. Again, this is non specific this is non-specific this is not great because again imagine me and you are sitting down and we're like right let's develop a drug we want it to specifically work on smooth muscle glands we want to increase the activity of the smooth muscle glands or we want to decrease the activity of the smooth muscle glands so either we're going to want to have a blocker we're either going to want to have an agony or an antagonist drug that's what we're going to want to develop an agonist or an antagonist drug and we're not going to particularly want to work on this part because if we work on this part we lose the effect of the drug on the muscarinic receptor on the smooth muscle so again we want to target here we want to be specific on the acetylcholine and the muscarinic receptor we want to be specific and target the muscarinic receptor on the smooth muscle glands. So that's what we want to do. And so um, the postganglionic part is shorter. So the postganglionic part is short. So parasympathetic, preganglionic long, acetylcholine nicotonic receptor, then postganglionic is short, acetylcholine muscarinic receptor, smooth muscle, sympathetic. Preganglionic is short, acetylcholine, nicotonic receptor, non-specific, non-specific. Postganglionic is long and it goes to two places, smooth muscle, sweat glands. Smooth muscle is to do with norepinephrine, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. Acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptor is to do with the sweat glands. And then finally, the last thing to know is the adrenal medulla and how the adrenal medulla works. And so this is um, the, the last one, the last bit that we need to, to know of the overall pathway. So the adrenal medulla, again, has preganglionic, and the preganglionic is short or, um, short or similar to that of the sympathetic. And it then has a specific acetylcholine and nicotonic receptor so we have the acetylcholine 
and the nicotonic receptor uh, on the adrenal medulla. And so what that then does is it reduces, it, it produces by binding, by binding the acetylcholine to the nicotonic receptor on the adrenal medulla, we produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so what we will look at is what epinephrine and norepinephrine do. So these are one, two, three, four. These are four pathways. One, two, three, and four. Now, the only one which is slightly more complicated is that of the sympathetic. And I say that because the somatic nervous system is pretty straightforward. It's just the motor neuron with the acetylcholine nicotonic end plate. So it looks like that. Boom, target tissue. The sympathetic is slightly different. So the sympathetic, it comes to a crossroad and then it divides into two. And that is to do with the two different tissue types. So it's either going to go there to do with norepinephrine or acetylcholine. So sympathetic is either to do with norepinephrine or acetylcholine. The, po the parasympathetic nervous system, again, has two divisions. It has the preganglionic, which is long. Then it has the acetylcholine with the nicotonic receptor. And then it has the acetylcholine with the muscarinic receptor. And the adrenal medulla, again, has preganglionic, short, which goes to the acetylcholine on the nicotonic receptor and then to the circulation where we're going to produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the, the major one to, uh, to remember is the sympathetic and how the sympathetic divides into two. Now, I'm just going to delete all of this for a minute because I know it's looking a bit chaotic. So I'll just delete that. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Do, 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 do. Right, let's get rid of that. Are you with me so far? Is that yeah. all familiar to you? Yeah. And also like um, the, like the different receptors that the norepinephrine binds to. I remember that um, when we had this, we talked about like the B2, for instance, is in the lungs. Um, and it does the... Uh, it has this vasodilating effect in the in the lungs, and uh, and then I think we mentioned also like um, in the heart that we had. Um, I think it was the uh, or like in the vessels we had the alpha one and two. Um, Absolutely, yeah, because they're very very specific. Yeah, they're very specific for their function. Yeah, in fact, uh, let me show you. So. Do, 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 do. Yeah, here we go. Alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. Mm. So we can actually look at how these work. So, for example, clonidine, how clonidine works um, is, well, in fact, I won't come to clonidine yet because I'll show you. We'll just we'll get to clonidine in just a moment. Um, let me just show you something else on the point. So the. The, the way to break it down is to, first of all, as I say, remember the difference between the somatic system, skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle. This is somatic efference and afference. Now, all of this is visceral. Everything under this line, this is all visceral. OK, this is all coming under the principles of general visceral efference and afference, GVE, GVA. OK, this is all this is all stuff we can't control. This is not under our conscious control. This is stuff which is going on. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic whirring away, working to make our heart work and everything else and do what needs to be done. What else will be beneficial to you? Let me tell you what will be really useful for you. Now, you know how important histology is and you know how important different tissue types are. What I would do. I, I think will be really beneficial is if you take this picture or you, um, uh, you know, if you take this picture or you draw it out, even if you want to draw it out yourself. And then what you can do from here, this basically is like a blueprint for your house. It's telling you 
the tissue types and the physiological and biochemical properties of the tissue types like so what i mean by that is um what you could do is you could have this diagram and then you could make a subset diagram you could have right skeletal muscle histi histology this is what it looks like so here's some slides with skeletal muscle blah 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 these are skeletal muscle has these type of cells these type of cells these type of cells these type of cells and does this smooth muscle has these type of cells, these type of cells, these type of cells, these type of cells, and does this. Sweat glands. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can like subdivide, divide your tissue types. It makes it so much easier. Then when you start to go through the body systems and you start to look at the body systems, you will instinctively know, like you were saying about the lungs, and the types of receptors in the lungs, the types of receptors in the airways, um, the, you know, all of the, uh, the different tissue types and, um, you know, how the drugs in, interact with these, with these different tissue types. Yeah, you, you, it, it's really useful just to, just to take it back to this, this very, very first picture. Um, it will really help you. Yeah, so let's break it down into a bit more detail. So alterations in autonomic function are produced by drugs acting to interfere with either the autonomic uh, motor nerves and the endogenous transmitters or the receptors in the affected tissue that they innovate. So that means this, drugs are either going to interfere with this, the receptor in the tissue, or the molecule itself. So either we're going to affect this bit or the receptor site. So we're either going to affect the uh, endogenous neurotransmitter or the receptor. So the receptor in the tissue or the molecules themselves. And so what we can do is we can facilitate or block transmission through the ganglia. And so interfering with this release affects the postganglionic nerve, i.e. which produces the effect. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at how this actually works. So here's a nerve. This is the end plate and this is the um, release. So we've got drugs which facilitate autonomic nervous transmission and we have drugs which inhibit nervous system transmit transmission. So ones increase and one decrease. So what do drugs do that facilitate autonomic transmission? They increase synthesis of neurotransmitter molecules. They increase neurotransmitter by destroying degrading enzymes. So they break down degrading enzymes because what degrading enzymes are gonna do is they're gonna break down the neurotransmitter. Drugs bind to presynaptic inhibitory receptors and block their effect. And drugs bind to postsynaptic receptors and activate them. So they block and activate and bl drop, uh, drugs block degradation of neurotransmitter molecules. And so there's two distinct ways that this works. And I'm going to show you um, some examples. So we're going to talk about things like amphetamine, amphetamines, cocaine, um, and how they work. And then we're going to look at some um, uh, more commercial drugs. So these are drugs which facilitate and we have drugs which block. So these are all increasing and these are decreasing. So drugs which decrease, drugs which decrease, they block the synthesis of the neurotransmitter molecule. So they stop the synthesis and therefore it decreases the effect. The drugs block the release of the neurotransmitter from the terminals. So they stop the drugs being released from the terminals. The drugs bind to presynaptic inhibitory incentives and activate them. And drugs block the postsynaptic receptor sites. So these are doing the opposite things to the facilitation. Now, I'm just going to just give you a rundown on the nicotonic receptors. Um, so just a recap on this bit again. So nicotonic receptors 
which we can see here. So here we've got the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. So here's our ladder and here's our ropes. Rope coming up, rope coming down. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. We've got the acetylcholine binding with the nicotonic receptors and we have the acetylcholine binding with the nicotonic receptors. Is on the nicotonic receptors facilitate transmission between pre and post ganglionics in ganglionic nerves in the autonomic nervous system, i.e., both in the parasympathetic and in the sympathetic motor nerves. So, in both systems, we have this. You see this, you see this crossroads on both sides. But this is important this is not the same as the somatic system. So don't get confused. Now, people often do. They often go, but wait a minute, Dr. Cobb, that's exactly the same as this. It's the same. It's the same, right? But surely this and this is the same as this. And I say, well, no, it's not. Because if you look at the somatic system, it is, uh, it's to do with acetylcholine on the nicotonic receptors on the skeletal muscle. This is not on skeletal muscle. This is not on skeletal muscle. So it's not the same. It's different. Their structure is different to the nicotonic receptors at the skeletal muscle end plate. So they are not the same. They are similar sounding, but they're not the same. They are not the same. So nicotonic agonists, what are they and what do they do? Well, like I said to you, if me, me and you were to design a drug together, who knows, maybe one day we will. <laughs> maybe we'll, divide, we'll design a drug together or several drugs and we'll be millionaires. Um, but if we were going to design a drug, this would not be a good idea. This would not be a good idea because it's non-specific, right? So things like nicotine, if people smoke, they talk about getting a nicotine hit you know they say that they get a nicotine hit and so it's interfering here it's you know it's non-specific they don't get specific symptoms so these drugs are used experimentally they have no clinical use because they are non-selective these are non-selective drugs they facilitate ganglionic transmission in both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system so nicotine activates both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system so people say i don't smoke personally but i've met many many people over the years that do smoke and they say oh i have a cigarette in the morning and i feel so calm oh i feel great okay so that's to do with the you know the the calming other people say they have a cigarette and their heart is racing you know so it is it's clearly affecting both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system so it has an effect on both of these and it's non-selective and so they facilitate transmission in both directions now let me just go back to this facilitation and inhibition so facilitation and inhibition so facilitation and inhibition so an example of some drugs uh, are things like cocaine so cocaine, how does this work? Um, now, this is going to link to, this is going to actually link to a couple of things, because one of the things we're going to talk about is levodopa. And we're going to talk about dopamine. And we're going to talk about noradrenaline. And we're going to link this with, this is going to become to do with depression. And this is also going to be linked to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot linked in with this one area. So I'm going to highlight this because we're going to come back to this. But so what you can see is there is a cascade that happens. So you've got phenylalanine, tyrosine, L-dopa, dopamine, noradrenaline, and then you have the release of this um, from the receptor, um, uh, from, from the end plate into the uh, tissue type. So certain drugs such as cocaine and ipramine inhibit this. So let me ask you a question. If somebody takes cocaine, what 
does that do to noradrenaline? Um, if someone takes cocaine. Yeah, uh, what happens to noradrenaline? We would have a high, like more noradrenaline would be produced. Right. Well, yeah, why? Um, because you would think that cocaine you would think that cocaine would do the opposite right because you would think surely don't we want noradrenaline to be continually pumped out mm. but no we don't we well <laughs> i'm not going to say no we don't but if you take cocaine right it's going to re uptake the noradrenaline so it's going to potentiate the noradrenaline so if you think about uh, noradrenaline as a straight line mm. you know it goes now if we take uh, the drug cocaine for example what's going to happen is the drug is going to block the it's going to inhibit the release and so they're going to have a reuptake of the drug and so what that's going to do is it's going to increase the amount of noradrenaline so that's why um, people who take drugs like cocaine or inhibitors or ipramine they get the increase in noradrenaline the noradrenaline is going to increase but then ultimately it's going to decrease and then they have to take it again and it increases and then it decreases and it increases and it decreases because what they are doing is they are over activating the uptake one so they are they are blocking uptake one they are stopping uptake one so it's just continue it's potentiating uptake one uptake two is this one so this is uptake two and this is uptake one so uptake one and all uptake two. So noradrenaline, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this because this is so important, because this is how um, our psychiatric medications work. And this is how our medications work, um, like levodopa and things like that. OK, so uptake one and uptake two. So noradrenaline is inactivated by being taken up in the presynaptic terminal. So it becomes inactivated by being taken up in the uh, pre night's presynaptic terminal. And this is called uptake one. So this is uptake one. This is here. OK, so we actually inactivate noradrenaline at this point. So if we block uptake one, if we block uptake one what we do is we potentiate which means we increase the action of noradrenaline and so there's several drugs that do this it's not just cocaine several drugs do this and these include amphetamines and antidepressants so cocaine amphetamines and antidepressants all work on uptake one. So this is to do with depression. This is to do with um, uh, dopa, dopamine release and control of dopamine release. So there's a link we'll come back to. So that's all to do with uptake one. Um, it may also be taken up by other tissues other than neurons and this is via uptake two so this is uptake two so this is uptake two now uptake two if we get to uptake two then we've already switched off the action of noradrenaline but obviously we want to increase noradrenaline in patients who are depressed or we want to increase it in certain other pathologies so it can also be taken up by other tissues other than the neurons and this happens in uptake two and so if we block uptake two, so if we block this bit, we have a different group of drugs. So uptake two, the type of drugs that we use in uptake two are things like corticosteroids. So this is to do with corticosteroids. So this bit is to do with corticosteroids. Just write cort. Um, 
corticosteroids. This is to do with corticosteroids. So uptake one, antidepressants, uptake two, corticosteroids. Metabolism of noradrenaline is achieved by something called monamine oxidase, MAO, and catecholamine O-methyltransferase, C-O-M-T. So this is metabolism of noradrenaline. Um, now, what we know is that depression, bipolar, and some of these other mental health conditions are to do with monamine oxidase. It is to do with um, the metabolism of noradrenaline. And so if we can somehow interact with MAO, or we can uh, uh, affect, the, affect the effect, affect the effect of MAO, we can increase uh, mood and therefore help with some of the symptoms. So that is to do with MAO. This is, uh, MAO is to do with metabolism of more noradrenaline. So MAO is to do with metabolism. And if we can affect metabolism of noradrenaline, we can therefore affect things like mood. So now let's look at these receptors, A1, 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 A2, B1, B2, and how they work. So these receptors, it's gonna go back a little bit. On the sympathetic system, we have the end plate, which is the norepinephrine, and the norepinephrine is going to affect the smooth muscle glands by the A1, A2, B1, B2 receptors. So again, what I was saying to you is super useful exercise for you, which will really, really help it stick in your mind, is to go and review all of your tissue types and link them here. So smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, where do we find the A1 receptors? Where do we find the A2 receptors? Where do we find the B1, B2, et cetera, et cetera? So the sympathetic nervous system on these A1, A2, B1, B2 receptors work in the following way. They work as follows. So these are the adrenoreceptors. So we're going to start off by looking at agonists. Agonists, what do they do? They increase. Antagonists do the opposite. These are blockers. So antagonists are blockers. Agonists are increasing activity. So let's look at some of these uh, different types. So for example, the adrenoreceptor on A1. Its effect is arterial smooth muscle contraction. So this is to do with arterial smooth muscle contraction. So if we give a drug, which is an agonist, and the effect is already arterial smooth muscle contraction, it's therefore going to increase that action of arterial smooth muscle contraction. And so some examples are things like nasal decongestants. And an example of one, well, of one particular nasal decongestion is phenylephrine. And so phenylephrine works by, it's an agonist, and it has an agonist response on the A1 receptor it increases arterial smooth muscle contraction, and therefore we can use phenylephrine as a nasal decongestion. Let's think about one in relation to the heart. Let's think about hypertension. Um, so let's think about how it works in hypertension. Right, so the alpha-2 receptor, what does the alpha-2 receptor do? The alpha-2 receptor inhibits noradrenaline release so let me ask you a question if we inhibit noradrenaline release what's that going to do we would get a lower blood pressure because the noradrenaline um yeah we would get a lower blood pressure because the noradrenaline we said it was the one that would it was a part of the uh, sympathetic uh, like the noradrenaline would bind to the um to the alpha two receptor. 
exactly so if you've got if alpha 2 if alpha 2 naturally inhibits noradrenaline release so it automatically reduces the amount of noradrenaline and you give a drug like clonidine clonidine is an agonist drug and clonidine is going to further inhibit noradrenaline release and so what that's going to be good for is things like hypertension. It is going to reduce hypertension because clonidine is an agonist. Clonidine is going to work on the A2 receptor and it's going to further reduce noradrenaline release. And so because it's going to further reduce, because uh, it's going to further reduce noradrenaline, it's going to slow the heart rate down. So it's going to, that's why we use clonidine for hypertension we wouldn't want to for example use a blocker here so if we used an antagonist on the alpha 2 receptor that would be a horrible idea because then what we would do is we would block the inhibition of the noradrenaline and the noradrenaline would just be able to go and go and go and go and go and increase and that's going to make a hard a hard hard but a hard, fast heart rate go even more. Sometimes you want to do that. Like, for example, in heart failure, if somebody is having heart failure, we want to do the opposite. We don't want the heart to slow down. We want the heart to increase. So um, interesting, isn't it? These are just these are just little channels which are very, very specific to the body function. So this is physiology 101. Um, B1. Now, you're going to know about these receptors for sure. So B1, what does B1 do? B1 is going to increase the rate and force of a heartbeat. So this is going to increase it. Now, why would we want to increase the rate and force of the heart? Well, if somebody's got heart failure, their heart isn't working. Their heart is not beating normally and it's not functioning. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to give a drug like dopabutamine and dopabutamine is going to bind to the B1 adrenal receptor. It's going to increase, increase the rate and force of the heart and therefore it's going to improve heart failure patients. So that's an, that's an example of another agonist, dopabutamine. And so this is an agonist and it works to increase the rate and force of the heart. What about B2? Well, B2, as you know, because you said you just said about this earlier on about the airways, B2 is to do with the airways. So the B2 receptors, these are going to have the following effects. B2 receptors are going to relax the smooth muscle in the bronchi. And therefore, if we give a drug like salbutamol, Salbutamol is an agonist, not an antagonist. Salbutamol is an agonist. And what salbutamol is going to do is it's going to further relax the smooth muscle by the B2 receptors and it's going to improve airway compliance. So like in the case of asthma. Perfect. Exactly. Yes. In, so in, 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 in asthma, people are having difficulties breathing because the smooth muscle in the bronchi is irritated it's inflamed they're struggling to breathe so what we want to do is we want to crank up the action of the b2 receptor we're like come on b2 come on b2 work harder work harder work harder let's give it an agonist an agonist salbutamol agonist is going to crank it up make it work harder and therefore it's going to improve the airway compliance it's going to make it work better so these are all agonists. These are all of the classic agonists. And now, again, what, what I suggest would be super useful is go back to this picture, take this picture, take the tissue types, dub, 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 all of the tissues, divide every tissue that you've ever learned about, you can divide into these four categories. And from there, then you can use this and you can say, right, alpha one, Alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. This is to do with the heart. This is to do with the lung. This is to do with this. This is to do with this. These are the agonist drugs. These are the antagonist drugs. 
So these are all increases. These are decreases. So how do these work? These are the antagonists. These are blockers. These are blockers. So how do they work on the receptors? We'll start off again with A1, alpha 1. So what does alpha 1 do? Alpha 1 works on arterial muscle. So this is to do with arterial muscle contraction. Now, um, what we want to do here is maybe we want to decrease the amount of arterial muscle contraction. So in order to decrease the amount of arterial muscle contraction, we're going to have to give a blocker and we're going to want to give a potentially a blocker like prazosin. And so prazosin is an alpha one blocker, alpha one blocker, prazosin, alpha one blocker. And what that is going to do is the alpha one blocker, prazosin, is going to reduce arterial muscle contraction. And therefore, it is going to cause hypotension, low blood pressure. So the blood pressure was high. We give the prazosin, which is a arterial muscle contractor blocker. And therefore, it is going to reduce BP. It's going to slow down the blood pressure. It's going to slow down the arterial muscle contraction. OK, let's think about some other drugs. What about alpha-2? What about alpha-2? How does alpha-2 work? So alpha-2, what alpha-2 does is it inhibits presynaptic noradrenaline release. So this inhibits presynaptic noradrenaline release. Um, we don't necessarily want to do that. So um, it's really only experimentally used at the moment. So it's not really clinically used because noradrenaline, uh, we want to, in general, we want to um, increase noradrenaline. So we don't want to inhibit it anymore certain cases we might want to but really not often normally it's the other way around so beta one and beta two so beta one is going to increase the rate and force of the heart so this is the natural mechanism of the beta one receptor and so the beta one receptor if we block the beta one receptor we can induce hypotension. We can induce hypotension by using a drug like Practolol, which is an antagonist. It's a blocker. And Practolol is going to work on the beta 1 and it's going to decrease the rate and force of the heart. It's going to do the opposite. And the beta 2. Again, this is to do with the lungs. So, for example, the agonists, salbutamol, the opposite of uh, an agonist for B2 is a really bad idea. So we don't want to use an antagonist blocker on somebody who has already got um, a lung condition. Because, for example, the normal action of the B2 receptor is to relax smooth muscle in the bronchi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if we were to give a drug like that, we could potentially put somebody into pulmonary arrest, right? Mm. Because it, they, we're going to block the blocker and we're going to induce pulmonary arrest. So there's experimental drugs like butoxamine, butoxamine these are experimental drugs not clinically used as you will see not clinically used we don't want to use antagonists to uh, work on the um, pulmonary system so these are the agonists the antagonists on the alpha ones and the uh, and the uh, alpha ones and the alpha twos in relation to the sympathetic nervous system so now what we want to do is we want to look at the parasympathetic nervous system. So now we're going to look at the parasympathetic nervous system and how that works. So the parasympathetic nervous system works by acetylcholine. 
And so acetylcholine is released at the effector sites of the parasympathetic nervous system. And the acetylcholine works on the muscuorenic receptors. It works on the muscuorenic receptors. And so agonist drugs directed at the muscuorenic receptors have little clinical usage except to increase gut and bladder motility after surgery. So you've got pilocarpine and carbacol. These are two examples of these types of drugs. Now this works on a different set of receptors. So the muscuorenic receptors is the acetylcholine binding on the muscuorenic receptors. And so the muscuorenic receptors are broken into M1, M2, M3, and M4. And that's quite easy to remember because it's muscurenic, one, two, three, and four. Okay, not to be confused with alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, different. That's to do with the sympathetic. This is the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic muscurenic receptors. So muscurenic receptor M1, what does it do? It has a physiological effect in gastric secretion. So this is to do with gastric secretion. So if we give a drug such as pyrazepine, we can reduce gastric acid. So what kind of drug is that? What kind uh, of drug is that? It's an M1 antagonist, so. Why? It's an antagonist, yeah, exactly. It's an M1 antagonist because it's going to reduce gastric secretion. Exactly. M2, M2 is to do with constriction of the pupil. So this is what M2 normally does. So if we do the opposite and we give a drug like atropine, Again, we're going to do the opposite. Instead of constricting the pupil, we're going to dilate the pupil. So we're going to look inside the eye. Like when you go to the um, ophthalmologist and they look inside your eye, they might want to use atropine so they can look deep into the back of your eye and see that everything's okay. M3, what M3 is going to do is it's going to increase smooth muscle tone and glandular secretion. So again, if you give atropine, atropine is going to do the opposite and it is going to decrease that. And so we can use atropine as a antispasmotic as well to reduce spasms. So atropine is really useful. Atropine is an antagonist. M4, constriction of the pupil. This is to do with closing of the pupil. We can use drugs like tropicamide, and tropicamide can be used to dilate the pupil. So it does the opposite because it's a blocker. So is there like two receptors for the pupil? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, like for example, M3 um, atropine and tropic tropicamide. Um, they might want because atropine has got like certain drugs, as as I'm sure you already know, certain drugs, they work. They have several actions, like, for example, aspirin. Aspirin doesn't just have one action. It has multiple actions. And that's because of where it binds. And so so does things like atropine, like atropine works on M2 and M3. So maybe, for example, I don't know this for sure because I'm not not optometrist, tra but it might be that they use tro tropicamide as opposed to atropine um, to, for dilation of the pupil, things like that, because it's more specific. So it's more specific. And I'm just saying that, I'm not saying that's, that's correct. I'm just saying that's, you know, that's an example of um, what you will find in pharmacology is sometimes that drugs are super specific and that's because they, you know, they're very, very targeted to one receptor as opposed to multiple receptors. So now um, we can link this on with depression and antidepressant medications because it just follows straight on from there. So um, before I do that, is there anything I've said that you're not sure about? 
No, I feel like, so like I've, I've understood it this way. So we have the autonomic uh, nervous system and it's important to um, divide it up. So we have the somatic, which is the one we can control yeah. and it has motor neurons. Uh, yeah. And with the help of the neurotransmitter uh, acetylcholine, it can bind to the nicotinergic receptors in the skeletal muscles and we can yeah, decide. And I guess that this is the one that is, uh connected to the like different tracts that we have so like the yeah and then we have the sympathetic system which is divided into preganglionic and postganglionic um and uh, preganglionic uh, to postganglionic will be through the acetylcholine and the nicotinergic receptors yeah. but when it comes to the postganglionic it will be the norepinephrine for the smooth muscle through the alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two receptors, and for the sweat to the smooth muscle, and for the sweat glands, it'll be the muscarine receptors through the acetylcholine, and exactly. then the parasympathetic is the same until the postganglionic, where the acetylcholine will bind to the muscarine receptors in smooth muscles, and then we have the M one, M two, M three, M four. Exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. Exactly. Um, and also just remember the uh, difference between obviously the somatic and the sympathetic when it comes to visceral efferents and afferents, somatic, general somatic efferents and afferents and visceral efferents and afferents. So mm -hmm. somatic is very, very specific. This is very specific. This is what you can control. This is under conscious control. And um, this is not. So everything autonomic is not. Although they are starting to find that that's uh, that it's slightly more complicated than that, but you know textbook that that's that's the answer textbook. Okay, so let's look at the different types of depression and the different types of antidepressant drugs and how they then work with all of this. So this all links together. So um, depression and antidepressant drugs, we've got different types of depression. Uh, sorry, we've got different types of, of, of mood disorders. So we've got something called affective disorders. Um, and so affective disorders, they involve a disturbance of mood, which can include cognitive, emotional symptoms. Um, it can be associated with things like changes in behavior energy, appetite, and sleep, biological symptoms. Um, there are sometimes pathological extremes of normal continuum of normal, of normal mood. So people can go, you know, from up, up and down in, in their extremes. So we'll look at that. So there's affective disorders. Um, they can have extreme excitement and elation, which is called mania, to severe depression. So there's two types. We've got something called unipolar and bipolar. Unipolar and bipolar. So bipolar is um, ups and downs. You know, you have very extreme, a light, extreme uh, moments of happiness and elation or mania and severe moments of depression, as opposed to unipolar where, you know, you're depressed most of the time or, uh, you know, you're manic most of the time. So you're either too much or too little, or you're too little and too much all in one. So there we go, up or down, or one way or the other. Mm. Um, depression, uh, some of the signs uh, of depression, m misery, malaise, despair, guilt, apathy, indecisiveness, lack of energy, fatigue, changes in sleeping pattern, appetite loss, patients can describe suicidal ideology. Um, there's classifications of depression, there's something called reactive depression. Um, and reactive depression, you see a clear psycho uh, physiological cause. So for example, um, you know, somebody who's not necessarily uh, been depressed before, Maybe they have, you know, normally been quite um, capable of managing at home and things like that. Recently, their mother died or their father died or a child died and they, you know, they're really not coping and they're showing all of the signs. 
of depression. So this is called reactive depression. Reactive depression, as I say, you get a clear psychological cause. So there's something under, underneath it. You know, there's a reason for this type. Um, tend to have less symptoms, less likelihood of biological disturbance, effects around 3 to 10% of the population, incidences increase with age, and it's more common in females. So we tend to see it more common. We see more reactive depression in females and in the, old, in the older population. Endogenous depression is different. So reactive think a reaction, something has caused it. Endogenous is different. Endogenous doesn't have a clear cause. There's no clear cause for the uh, depression. Patients tend to have more severe symptoms. So they tend to have things like suicidal thoughts and ideology. Um, they tend to have greater biological disturbances. So they tend to have increased likelihood of things like insomnia, anorexia, self-harm, things like that. It affects 1% of the population and it usually starts earlier on in, in childhood and adulthood. And it affects both males and females uh, equally. So there's a big difference between reactive and endogenous depression. Reactive has a cause underlying cause endogenous potentially does not have a cause um, so distinction is important because evidence suggests that endogenous depression responds better to drug therapy so we think that endogenous depression is something that we can manage better with pharmacology as opposed to reactive depression which uh, is not necessarily solely managed with drug therapy it needs additional things to be considered so causes of depression unknown we're not entirely sure obviously there is a, um, a psychological element to this um, from a scientific perspective we think that it centers around monamine receptors and so that's why I wanted to highlight monamine receptors with you when we looked at the cascade. So we think it's to do with monamine receptor sensitivity. And so we think that by monitoring and controlling monamine set receptor sensitivity, we can control uh, depression to some degree, not control it, but manage it. So current, uh, current uh, theories go around monamine receptor sensitivity hypothesis. Abnormalities with the monomine um, uh, serotonin in the limbic system is believed to be uh, one of the underlying uh, problems with this. It is believed that it is to do with an abnormality in neurotransmission, which makes perfect sense, especially when we scroll back a little bit and we think about what we've been looking at today. And we think about, for example, cocaine and ipramine, and we think about the uh, excitatory effects that cocaine and ipramine has on noradrenaline and how that increases mood and how often patients, when they withdraw from these types of drugs, they have severe slumps in mood uh, and get driven towards bouts of extreme depression. So we think that it's to do with neurotransmission we think that there is also to do with an abnormality in receptor numbers and responsiveness. So receptor numbers and responsiveness is to do with binding. This is to do with drug binding and receptors, available receptors. So again, this comes back to more of the basic sciences. Um, and also... Uh, more evidence is pointing to reduced sertrogenic neurotransmission. So again, it's all to do with uh, neurotransmission. So in simple terms, it's hypothesized that depression is caused by low levels of monamine oxidase transmitter, uh, monamine transmitters, um, also to do with upregulation of postsynaptic monamine receptors and upregulation of presynaptic and somatodendric autoreceptors that control monamine release. 
So it's all about the monomins. <laughs> it's all about the monomins, okay? Controlling the monomins. So let's look at how this works. So as I say, causes, um, we think that the monomin theory explains why this, uh, why patients suffer from depression. Um, and so what we use are drugs that deplete the, um, uh, sorry, drugs that deplete the monomines are um, depressants. So certain drugs actually deplete monomines. And by depleting monomines, we therefore increase depression. So for example, therapine actually increase the depletion of monomines and therefore can induce depression. Drugs that increase the availability of monomines improve mood in depressed patients. So what kind of drugs do this? Now, this is where it gets really interesting because this is where we link antidepressant medication with medication that works in things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease because there's a, direct combo, there's a direct link between this. This is where it gets interesting. So drugs that increase availability of monomines improve mood in depressed patients. And these types of drugs are things like tricyclic antidepressants. This is one group. And monomine oxidase inhibitors. Hmm. So um, I think I've heard the monoamine oxidase inhibitors being used for people with Parkinson's. Exactly. Brilliant. Exact. That's the link. That's brilliant. Well done. Yes, that's right. That's the link. And that's why um, we have to when we give patients who are on Parkinson's disease drugs, they may be on antidepressant medications and their antidepressant medications can interfere with their parkinson's medications mm -hmm. they're both kind of working on the same thing so that's what exactly yeah you're absolutely right so do you know what monamine oxidase does it is the it would break down the dopamine right yeah so okay. if we inhibit it we would get more dopamine exactly okay yeah exactly exactly so if we stop down the breakdown we increase the dopamine right and that's mm -hmm. what we want so things like co-levodopa, these different types of drugs, um, these are going, these are really important because they're working on dopamine. Mm -hmm. um, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so we've got tricyclic antidepressants, which we'll look at how tricyclic antidepressants work. And we've got monomine oxidase inhibitors. And just like you said, monomine oxidase inhibitors do exactly what you said. They stop the breakdown of the monomine. So these oxy, they stop these inhibitors. Um, the only thing is there are there's some things missing with the theory. The theory can't explain why some compounds that increase monomine availability have no effect on the mood of depressed patients. For example, amphetamines and cocaine. But actually, I think that this, um, I, I slightly disagree with this, and I'll tell you why. Um, because if you think about how cocaine and amphetamines work, so let's just do a couple of graphs here. You know, what cocaine is doing is cocaine is having an upsurgence. So at the peak, the patients have euphoria, and I shouldn't say patients, but you know, people are having euphoric moments. And then there's a rapid decrease, and then it comes up, and you have to take the drug again. But over time, it's going to wear off. So, you know, it, amphetamines and cocaine, they are only ever going to reach a maximal plateau. And after a while, you know, like anybody who is a perpetual drug user will tell you the same story. They have to take more and more and more and more and more and more of the drug to get the same high. So um, it, it's it, the reason that the amphetamines, or, or this is my interpretation, this isn't a textbook answer, but the reason to me it makes sense that amphetamines and cocaine don't work on mood uh, in depressed patients is because it's only having 
a very limited peak it's only having a very it's not it's not long term like for example if you take um not amitriptyline that's a horrible drug um um prozac you take prozac it takes about a month three weeks to four weeks for it to get into the blood concentration to get to a therapeutic range then the patient keeps taking it sometimes for years and it stays in a therapeutic range so that's the graph of something like prozac constant cocaine use is like this up and down so it's never going to monitor it's never going to stay in a therapeutic range. So this is all to do with therapeutic and toxic ranges. So this is a therapeutic drug. You know, this is why we say to patients, hey, look, don't just take Prozac for one week and then expect it to start working. It's going to take several weeks to get into the body, to get into the plasma, to get the body to an effective concentration. And then it's going to start to work. Um, so atypical antidepressants work without affecting um, the amonamin systems. Uh, we're going to look at these and how they work. There is a therapeutic delay between full neurochemical effects and the start of the therapeutic range. So that's exactly to do with, as I say, it takes several weeks for the drug to actually start to get into a therapeutic range. Like, for example, if somebody takes it for a week and then stops taking it, bang it immediately goes under the therapeutic range and then they have to start all over again and then they start taking it. Now that I think mimics the same thing that amphetamines do on a longer scale, you know, cause you're going up peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, unlikely that monomine systems alone are responsible for symptoms of depressions. Yes, there is um, uh, also uh, research to suggest that other systems are involved, such as the GABA system. So the GABA system, neuropeptide systems, vasopressin, endogenous opiates, secondary messenger system, all of these things are un undoubtedly involved with depression and the depressive state, and in turn are also involved in the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, um, uh, like Parkinson's disease and things like that. So what are the treatment methods? How are we gonna physiologically, biochemically, pharmacologically manage this? We're going to want to try and enhance monomin levels. We are going to want to try and blockade monomin receptors, therefore to increase uptake. And we're going to want to block oxidase. We're going to want to block monomine oxidase because monomine oxidase is ultimately going to block it down. So we want to do that. We want to block the monomine receptors. There's a receptor, there's a blocker. We're going to want to block that, increase uptake. And we're going to want to inhibit monomine oxidase, stop monomine oxidase from doing what it wants to do, which is break it down. So different types of classes of antidepressants. We have our tricyclic antidepressants, which are called TCAs. These include drugs like amitriptyline and ipramine. These are TCAs. These are tricyclic antidepressants. These are not very nice drugs, by the way. They have a lot of side effects. And so we're going to talk about those. We also have drugs which are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are SSRIs. And so these are much more common drugs, which you'll be familiar with. These are selective serotonin. This is to do with serotonin. This is to do with inhibition of the reuptake. And these are drugs like fluoxetine, which is Prozac, paroxetine, which is uh, Cerazat, and Cetraline, Cetraline, Lustral. These are selective SSRIs. These are much more common. These are probably the drugs that you're going to give to your patients nine times out of 10, unless you're working in psychiatric fields. Um, and then also you've got serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. These are called SNRIs. And these are things like venaflaxine, Effexor, 
and you have selective noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. These are called NRIs. And these are drugs like riboxetine and mepropetaline. I always struggle with these ones. Um, we have specific serotonin and adrenergic receptor blockers, mitrazapine. We have serotonin 5-HT receptor blockers. I'm going to show you how all of these drugs work. I won't today because uh, we're going to run out of time, but I'll just show you the categories to start with. So serotonin 5-HT receptor blockers include things like trazodone and nefazodone. You have classical non-selective monomane oxidase inhibitors. Now we're interested in these. We're going to concentrate a lot on these especially when we talk about pathology, monamine oxidase inhibitors. And we have reversal inhibitors of monamine oxidase, RIMAs. So these are reversal inhibitors. So classical ones include things like phenylazine, tranylkypramine, and the reversal inhibitors are moclobamide manorix. Yeah, I can only remember the, I can only pronounce the, the, the generic ones much easier, manorix. So these are the different categories. So these are the different ones you've got. And I shall stop there because um, we're just coming up to two hours and I'm sure you've got some questions or hopefully maybe not too much. If I've done a good job, then maybe that's quite clear, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's been very good actually, and um, I've had a lot like uh, I like I've forgotten a lot about uh, a lot about these things, and we've mentioned like in we had this course uh, a couple of months ago about the SSRE and the SNRE, so it's very good to like hear about it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for uh, the thing I was thinking about for next time, maybe when we have like because uh, I assume we're gonna keep talking about the nervous system. Uh, like if we could go through a bit about like breathing regulation, because I know like um, how the nervous system is there and like also the digestion of uh, uh, food, like the cephalic, the gastric phase and all these phases. Oh, yes, I absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go through. Um, I mean, this bit, there's, there's a little bit more to go on depression, not a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yes, we can go through. We go through the nervous system. Uh, the thing I want, I'm, I'm not sure, is how much detail you want to go into embryo. Um, if you haven't covered a much embryo, then I won't destroy your brain with information that you don't need. Mm. That's yeah. the only. That's the only thing. Um, that's yeah. the only. I think like that would be um, uh, like if we could mention a bit about embryo, like the general things about embryo I think that would be good uh, yeah then maybe like mainly focus on physiology like organ physiology so like Absolutely. the heart the lungs the kidneys okay that sounds like a plan so if you want to go you need to cover dementia don't you and Alzheimer's disease yeah. right yeah and do you need to know about antipsychotics yeah that too 